Hi, I'm Julie Johnson with Firebox Training. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the Java primitive data types. A primitive is simply a data type that can't be broken down any further. It's built into the Java language. Whereas other data types, which are objects, those can be broken down into smaller data types down to your primitives. Okay, so let's uh, do a few examples here. I'm going to create a new application here in JDeveloper. And I'll just call this Primitives. Hit Next. Okay, and now I'm going to create a new Java class. And I'm just going to call this Primitive Test. And we'll include a main method in there. And I don't need that guy right there. Okay, so the first data type that I want to talk about is the byte data type. So keep in mind that all of our primitive data types start with a lowercase letter. This is important to understand because for each one of our primitive data types, there's also a corresponding uh, object wrapper type, which we'll discuss here in a moment. Okay, so let's just say byte b equals, and we're going to assign this a value. Now the range, the possible range of bytes is pretty small, and that's because bytes only consume one byte of memory. It's also important to understand that this range here, byte is a lot like an integer in that it can't hold any uh, floating point value. So it is like a, a small int. Okay, so let's now take a look at another data type like this, except it has a slightly larger range and it consumes two bytes of memory, and that is the data type called short. Next we have the int data type. An int consumes four bytes of memory. And of course, you know, since it consumes more memory, it also has a larger range. And if you need to have a variable that, uh, that cannot be, you know, if you have a value that cannot be represented by the range of ints, you can go even larger than that, and that is the long data type. So the long data type consumes 8 bytes of memory. Now we put the letter L, either upper or lowercase, at the end to indicate that this is a long rather than an int. Okay, now our next data type is a char, which represents a character. Okay, so when I define a character, I put it inside of a single quote. I can either do it like this. By the way, a char consumes two bytes of memory. I can also represent it with Unicode. Unicode is simply a special notation that we use for special characters. So if I had, let's say, a Japanese kanji character that I wanted to represent, I would go find this character code in the Unicode uh, charts and then represent it with a backslash U and then the four-digit code. Okay. Next we have the double and float. Let's do float first. If we need to represent floating point numbers, we need to put either a lowercase or uppercase f at the end to indicate that it's a float and not a double. And then we have our double. So what's the difference between float and double? The precision. And so of course double is going to consume more memory. A float consumes four bytes of memory, and a double consumes eight bytes of memory. Okay, now there's one more data type here, and that's the Boolean. We'll call this bool, and that's going to be set to either true or false in all lowercase letters. So a Boolean consumes one byte of memory. Okay, so for each one of these data types here, we have eight primitive data types. For each one of these, we have a corresponding 
wrapper type, which is simply an object representation of that data type. So why would we want to use a wrapper type? Well, the wrapper types have useful methods such as, you know, if we were to use the integer wrapper type, let's do an example of that real quick. I, I'm doing WI, which stands for wrapper integer. Okay, so uh, one of the ways I can instantiate this wrapper type is to do this. I can place inside of here my primitive like that. Okay, so what can I do with this? Well, you'll see here that I have all sorts of useful methods like I can get the uh, floating point value returned from that. So if I wanted to return a primitive float representation of that, I could do that. So that's useful if I need to, um, you know, pass this to a method that required a float, right? Okay, so other things you can do, there's all sorts of static methods. So if I say integer dot, you'll see here that I can obtain the max value and possible min value. Okay, so if I want to see, for example, what the range is, let me see what the max value of int is. I'm going to do a system dot out dot print line and we're going to print out the max value. Let's go ahead and print out the min value as well. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and right click and run this. And let's look at our log right here. Here we can see what the range of values is. Okay, let's do the same sort of thing for our bytes. If you want to get an idea of what the range for byte is. Okay. One other concept I want to talk about is auto boxing. Um, this was introduced in Java 5, and uh, auto boxing simply means that conversion between the primitive and the object type is implicitly done for you. Okay, so prior to Java 5, if you had a method that was expecting a primitive int, you actually had to pass it a primitive int. Okay, but in Java 5 and later, it would actually accept a wrapper type or vice versa. Okay, so that's all that auto boxing is. I also want to mention that the primitive data types here have better performance. For example, if I wanted to loop through a thousand integers, uh, if I'm dealing with primitives, looping through those one by one, I'm going to have a big difference in performance compared to looping through the wrapper type ints. So if performance is, is an issue for you, make sure you stick with the primitive data types. Well, I hope you got a lot out of this quick video tutorial. Please visit our website at www.fireboxtraining.com.